Auburn, Alabama is home to Auburn University, which is a major football school. In a college town, it happens that students sometimes may go off and, you know, they may be missing for a little while, but they come back. Lori was a student at Auburn University, and she had recently graduated. June 10th, yes. 2006, which is the fateful day in Lori's life. We were going to have drinks at my house. We were going to have um, rum runners, I believe, and watch a movie and just kind of hang out, do girl time. She called me around 6.30 and said, I'm going to stop by the store, pick up the drink mixes, and then I'll be headed to your house. And then the phone rang about 30 minutes later. It rang once or twice. I answered. No one was there. How many times had she simply not showed up Never. and not called you? Never. My daughter was a very good person, a kind person, a loving girl, a very studious student. She loved sports, loved her dog. She had a little Yorkie named Peanut. That was her baby. When did you realize that something was wrong? I was at work. A lady called. I believe it was her boss. And she told me that I just want to tell you your daughter, Lori, has not showed up for work. And right away, bells and whistles went off. I called her, and she didn't answer her phone. I called her house several times, left voicemails on her home answering machine. You go over to her mobile home. The door was unlocked, which was not like her. The air condition was running. Her dog, Peanut, was in the crate. We walked through the house. She wasn't there. What are you thinking? Something's terribly wrong. There is no way she would have left Peanut. This is it. It's about 4.40 AM, four days after Lori is missing. The car was right here, dead in the center, and engulfed in flames. Was Lori in this car? Lori was not in the vehicle. There was no trace of her whatsoever. I mean, none. Just vanished. Just vanished. And nobody knows what happened to Lori Slazinski. I know somebody that knows. Rick Ennis. Your daughter had no idea about his past. No. I met Rick Ennis when he was 12 years old. He's sitting back there in that seat behind you. And I said, where are your parents? He looks right back at me, and he says, I killed them both. I can still see her smile. Her smile is just etched in my memory. To this day, Lindsey Braun is haunted by the final call from Lori Slazinski on June 10th, 2006, when they were supposed to get together for drinks and a movie. That last call, did it indicate it was her phone? Yes. She calls and it hangs up. Yes. And no one's there. Just no one was there. It was just dead end. Did you call her right back? I did. No mm -hmm. answer. Lori and Lindsay became fast friends when they met junior year at Auburn University in 2002. I remember the day I met her. We just kind of immediately clicked. But I could just tell that she was a warm person, very friendly, just outgoing, loving, all those good things. Lori's family, her older brother Paul, and their parents, Arlene and Casey, were actually from New York State. They headed south to rural Alabama farm country when Lori was 13 years old. She loved animals. We always had animals in our house. <laughs> Lori's mother, Arlene. A very studious student. She was a good girl. 
When she enrolled in nearby Auburn University, her parents bought Lori a mobile home to live off campus in a manicured trailer park popular with students. So from valedictorian of her high school class, was it tough for you to see your baby girl leave the house and head off to university? Oh yeah, it was very tough. I called her every day. She's like, Mom, this has got to stop. I was like, but you're my baby and I worry about you. Just don't worry about me, I'm fine. Lori majored in psychology and minored in criminal justice. She graduated with honors. There she is with mom and dad. She looks so happy there. She was, she was over the moon happy. After graduation, Lori and Lindsay started working together at a local mental health facility. Did you sense that she had any enemy in this world? No. The day that Lori disappeared, June 10th, 2006. Was anyone with Lori that day? Rick was at her house. Rick was Daryl Richard Ennis. When I had spoken to her, he was in the background. Lori got to know Rick back when she was still a student. She hung out at the local bowling alley where he worked. I didn't know much about him at all, except he was her friend. Arlene says just before Christmas in 2005, Lori asked if Rick could join them. She asked me, she said, Mom, he has no family. Can I invite him? She kind of, you know, felt bad that he was going to spend Christmas alone. He was friendly, um, very polite. Lindsay says Lori often spent time with Rick, so she wasn't surprised that he had been at Lori's home the day she disappeared. They were friends, so I, I wasn't concerned. But now you're at home yes. waiting for Lori to come yes. over. And you went to bed that night thinking, you know, I hope she's OK. But the next morning, Lindsay started to worry. I called her house several times, left voicemails on her home answering machine. Hey, Lori, checking on you. Are you OK? Where are you? You went to work on that Monday, right? Yeah. Uh, she wasn't there. In my mind, something's wrong. I had Rick's number, so I did text him and ask, have you seen Lori? Where is she? I'm worried about her. Um, his conversation back was, no, I haven't, and I'm worried now, too. When Lori didn't show up at work a second day, that's when Lindsay headed to Lori's home. No one answered. And found her dog, Peanut, in his crate. I'm an animal lover, so the very first thing I did was let the dog out. That's when she noticed something else strange. Lori was missing three days, but the crate was spotless, and Peanut seemed happy and appeared to be well-fed, as though someone had taken care of him. And there was more. One thing I remember about Peanut is he wouldn't walk on tile, so she had these rugs in her uh, kitchen, and he would hop on the rugs, and the rugs were gone. I noticed that immediately. Her outside trash can was missing. She had one that she had, like, yard tools in, and the answer machine had actually been unplugged, so those messages were not there. By this time, Lori's mother heard that she hadn't been showing up at work. I have got to go to Auburn and see what's going on, where she is, because I called her and she didn't answer her phone. She headed off on an agonizing drive, calling her husband and alerting the police, finally arriving at her daughter's home. And when the police got there, what was their attitude? Well, you know, they were like, she's got to be missing 48 hours, and they didn't really think a big, make a big deal out of it. They wanted to just think she ran away. Lori's parents could only wait for Lori to walk through the door or call. And finally, the phone rang late that afternoon. But Arlene says it wasn't Lori, it was her friend, Rick Ennis. He said that Lori had gone to make a big drug deal. What? Yes. And I was like, there ain't no way that my daughter would not do anything like that. Did you tell the police what he told you? I didn't. Rick told them. And the police came to the trailer, banging on the door, and they raided the mobile home, and they found nothing. Then, just before dawn, that's when Lori Slazinski's missing car suddenly exploded into a fireball on a desolate dead end outside a construction site. The feelings were just unbelievable of fear and knowing something really bad has happened. Who would set her car on fire? Exactly. And why? The investigation shifted from a missing person to a possible homicide. Investigators dug into Rick's tip about Lori dealing drugs, but found no evidence, none, 
that he was telling the truth. Now, investigators started digging deeper into Rick Ennis. They wanted to know if he was hiding something from them. Did you have any sense as to why Rick Ennis didn't have a family? No, I had no idea why at all. Eventually, you learned. I did. It's beyond shocking. This is my daughter Lori's trailer. And do you go into that trailer from time to time just to connect with her? Um, I do. Just go in there and think about the happier times. This room, besides the memories, is also a solemn place because you believe some horrors went on in this room, correct? Yes. In the early days of the investigation, back in 2006, Arlene says she became suspicious of Rick Ennis when he told her that the night Lori disappeared, she had gone out to make a drug deal. And why would he be doing that, do you think? I think to take the heat off of him. I was thinking this guy is lying through his teeth. Police suspected the same, but without direct evidence linking Rick Ennis to Lori's disappearance, police could not make an arrest and the case quickly went cold. Did Rick Ennis stick around town? He was there for a couple of days, but within a, a week after his third interview, he left town. He never came back to Auburn again. In 2016, 10 years after Lori disappeared, Mark Whitaker, a special agent with the Alabama State Bureau of Investigation, started a cold case unit. He chose the disappearance of Lori Slazinski as his first case. Any estimate of how many murder cases you've been involved with in your career? Probably about 100. Where does this one rank in terms of fascination for you as an investigator? It's number one. It was a very difficult case because there was no body. We don't know exactly what happened. And uh, we don't know where she is. But it didn't take long for Rick Ennis to become Whitaker's prime suspect. We couldn't eliminate him. His inconsistencies in his statements made no sense whatsoever. We knew Lori was not a drug dealer. I mean, she vanished off the face of the earth when he's the last one to ever see her. And when police spoke to Rick hours after Lori was reported missing, they noticed these scratches on his hands and arms. Right here, that is a thumbprint where somebody's digging in there. She's fighting for her life and doing everything she can to get away from him. In Rick's car, there were handcuffs, this knife, and cleaning supplies. And they soon learned something startling about Rick's past. Turned into one of the most bizarre cases I've ever been associated with. Former Alabama State Trooper John Clark. I was patrolling this county when I got a call. It was March 5th, 1993. The call from dispatch said a car had gone off this very highway and struck a fence. And as my uh, headlights take in the curve, I see it looks like a young boy with a backpack. It's a 12-year-old, Rick Ennis, and he admits he had been driving the car. Clark searches his backpack. The first thing I pull out is a kitchen knife about that long. There's some uh, 12 gauge and some 22 caliber loose ammunition in the bottom of the bag. He's sitting back there in that seat behind you. And I said, where are your parents? He looks right back at me and he says, I killed them both. I killed them both. I killed them both. No tears, no emotion, nothing. Clark then radioed for local police to get over to Ennis's home. State troopers working a wreck involving a 12-year-old. At the time, a show called MPD, the television series, was following the officers. The boy's telling them that they killed his daddy and mama. Cameras entered the home of Rick's mother and stepfather. On the floor of a bedroom are two dead bodies. There's pieces of uh, a baseball bat in the bedroom that has quite a bit of blood on it. Rick's own mother, Dolly Flowers, was shot in the face and then beaten to death with this baseball bat. 
Rick told investigators he covered her face with a velvet blanket and placed a rose on her chest. Blood splatters on the walls, blood splatters on the door. Rick's stepfather, Eddie Joe Flowers, was known as Elvis for his sideburns and colorful personality. Rick shot him in the face using this shotgun. Rick told cops he was mad that his parents planned to move. He said he didn't want to leave his school. For two days, investigators believe he lived with their bodies while continuing to go to school. Investigators say they found what they describe as Ennis's to-do list that included killing his three stepsisters. So he wanted to kill all three of you? Oh, yeah. I feel very blessed to be here and not to be one of his victims. Donna Fur, Angela Flowers, and Tina Sexton are all Eddie's daughters. Tina was 20 when her dad was murdered. It's changed everything. My dad was my world. I'm never getting to see him again. The sisters say Dolly was a sweet, outgoing woman who met their father in church. Rick was the polar opposite. Every time I would go and visit my dad and Dolly, they, he would go into his bedroom and close himself off. He'd come out and eat, and then he'd go back in his room. What is the longest conversation you ever had with him? Five seconds, maybe. He didn't talk to nobody. What did your father think of Rick? He just said, he's just a little different than, than y'all were when y'all were coming up. He just thought that they were in a new relationship and, you know, that it would, he would outgrow it and things would get better over time. But just 10 months after they married, the happy couple were dead. He was 12 years old and had murdered two people, brutally murdered them. At age 12, Rick Ennis couldn't be tried as an adult. He spent nine years in juvenile detention in Alabama and was released after he turned 21. It was now up to Agent Whitaker and his team to determine whether Rick Ennis had murdered again. Should juveniles convicted of murder get a second chance? Chat now with the 48 Hours team on Facebook and Twitter. Agent Mark Whitaker knew what Rick Ennis did to his parents, and his instincts told him Ennis had done something horrible to Lori, too. But now, he had to prove it. The burn site that's found on the 14th, the car was right here, facing out back toward the bowling alley. There's nothing else around here at the time. There's not apartments. It's just a paved road. The blaze destroyed whatever evidence there was in the car, but an investigator reported finding a tiny item on the ground nearby. And he found a hand-rolled cigarette butt about right here, and he collected that. It was not tested. Kind of got lost in the shuffle. The case agent retired. Whitaker's team now submitted it for testing. And there was this gas can that had been found nearby. It was right in this area right here. It looked like one that had been missing from the bowling alley where Rick had worked. And it's right here, a thousand yards from the bowling alley, 30 yards from a car. Whitaker's partner, J.W. Barnes, showed us something that for police tied everything together. These railroad tracks. These are the same tracks that go right by the bowling alley. They run right across the street from where Laurie's car was found burning. I've always thought that's what Ennis used for transportation was walking down the railroad tracks because it's a straight shot and you're not going to be seen unless you want to be seen. And those railroad tracks run by Lori's house. And in that house were signs of a violent struggle, says Whitaker. These areas you see right here that have been cut out, that's where the scuff marks were. They were black, just like the bottom of her shoes. And, and there was even some up as high here. So it's obviously there was a struggle in here with somebody kicking their legs probably up in the air. Remember, Lori's dog, Peanut, seemed happy and taken care of. My theory is that Rick Ennis stayed in the house. After he had murdered Lori? I believe so. It's the only way to explain it. We don't have a cause of death, but I've always thought that he strangled her. The scratches that he had all over his arm were just indicative of 
defense wounds when you're fighting somebody. Whitaker says the phone in the corner of the bedroom really was missing its cord. And it was a long cord, and it ran all the way through the room. And what do you think that cord was used for? I think it was used to bound her. To tie her up? Yes, sir. Could it have been used to strangle her? Sure. That phone cord was missing. That's not the only thing that was missing. There were those three rugs in the kitchen. They were kind of strategically put out so that Peanut, Lori's dog, could hop through the linoleum and be back on carpet. The rugs turned up, he says, a few years later. Ennis had a former roommate who reached out to law enforcement and told them, hey, this this guy left behind three rugs. Peter, I want to show you something else. Lori had a table set up about right here. And on this table, days before Lori went missing, a love letter was left here for her from Rick. People who knew Lori said Ennis wanted to be more than just a friend. Police say Ennis told a buddy that Lori rejected him. And he was devastated by that. So do you believe this rejection may have been a motive for murder? I think that's what sent him over the edge. I I absolutely do. Despite the mounting evidence, Agent Whitaker still needed something more that tied Ennis directly to the crime scene. As far as I'm concerned, he is investigating this case like Lori is his own daughter. I mean, he has a picture of Lori in his house. I've had it in my closet. It made me think about her every day when I was getting ready for work, when I would put my ties on. I would just remember what I was supposed to be doing every single day. And then... It's like 1 o'clock in the morning, and J.W. calls me. J.W. Barnes found exactly what they needed in the case files, collecting dust for 10 years. He goes, I just found a report that was in an envelope that hadn't been opened. Whitaker could hardly believe it. When Lori disappeared in 2006, police collected evidence from her trailer. But by the time the results came in, no one followed up. The report contained critical evidence. Rick's DNA was identified in semen found on Lori's bedsheet and in blood on the interior of the front door. And it turned out his blood was also found on one of the rugs investigators say were in Lori's kitchen. So you got his blood on a rug here. You've got his semen back there. You got his blood on a door. Most people's blood is not inside somebody else's home unless something really bad had happened. 12 years after Lori disappeared, there was now enough evidence to charge Rick Ennis with her murder. But by this time, Rick Ennis was happily engaged to school librarian Elena Atkinson and living 500 miles away in Virginia. He was designing and building portable living structures called yurts for Sharon Morley's company. Morley liked Ennis from the moment they met. He was just so open and friendly and had a great sense of humor. But on August 6, 2018, Rick's birthday, Morley saw a task force of lawmen arrive. Walking out of the woods, they were hiding behind trees. They had the place surrounded. It was a highlight of my career to make the phone call to Arlene and Casey Slosinski that morning to tell them that we just took Rick Ennis in custody for Lori's murder. Was this kind of a bittersweet moment for you? Most definitely, yes. I guess psychologically, I never accepted the fact that she really was gone. And I cried big time, yeah. Later that month, Ennis appeared before an Alabama judge with Lori's parents facing him. I guess he kind of seemed surprised that we were there. What did you want him to know? That we finally got you. You're not gonna get away with this. News of Ennis' arrest quickly spread. I read it, and I'm like thinking to myself, it's Rick. Terry Booth says he was friends with Rick and suddenly remembered a conversation he had with him years earlier at a bar when he asked him why he left Alabama. What did he say? He just mainly said I had to get rid of a And I'm thinking, oh, this guy's just messing around with me. But that changed when he learned of Rick's arrest. And it was real. He wasn't joking. I couldn't sleep the whole night. 
he called Whitaker's task force. And it was just unbelievable what Ennis had told him. But the most explosive news of all came later. And incredibly, while Whitaker was with Ennis at another court hearing. An investigator from Auburn PD comes up to him and tells me, you're not going to believe this. The hand rolled cigarette butt next to the car has his DNA on it. I wanted to do a somersault in the courtroom, but I couldn't. Everyone now was prepared to go to trial. But the courts quickly ground to a halt because of the pandemic. And Arlene Slazinski suffered more losses. First, her son to cancer, and then her husband, Casey, to COVID. I got a call him. I think you better come. When I got there, he was gone. <laughs> You lose your daughter, you lose your son, and then you lose your husband. How do you go on with all this? I guess my faith, my friends, family. And I just did not want to die not knowing what happened to my daughter or seeing justice being done. But Rick Ennis was determined to prove police had it all wrong. And he wasn't the only one fighting to prove his innocence. They have the wrong person. There's, there's no way. His fiance, Elena Atkinson. Do you believe Rick had anything to do with Lori's disappearance with her death? No, I do not. You know, not only do I believe Rick is innocent, I believe that he would have given his life for Lori if he had been there. That's the kind of person he is. And she believes that despite the fact that she knows Rick murdered his mother and stepfather when he was 12. People would wonder, why is it hard for you to believe that he could kill again? She says Rick told her something about what happened with his mother, something that convinced her he had nothing to do with what happened to Lori. Rick Ennis is one of the most compassionate, generous, kind people that I've ever known. Elena Atkinson has been in love with Rick Ennis for four years. I love his intelligence. I always joke with him and tell him I fell in love with his brain first. <laughs> but just two months into their romance, Elena, an amateur genealogist, was researching Rick's ancestry when she stumbled upon news that he had killed his mother and stepfather. My first thought was, what in the world happened in his home life that pushed him to that point? Rick would tell her something she didn't see in any article. Rick, it's Peter Van Sant with 48 Hours. Oh, Reached by phone, Rick told us what he insists Thanks happened. So I was molested by my mother. Rick says his mother sexually abused him, and he snapped. I exploded, and the result was that I, I took my mother's life, and then I took my stepfather's life. But remember, back then, he told authorities he killed his parents because he didn't want to move. I was deeply ashamed about my mother molesting me, and I had a really hard time talking about it. Still, we could find no evidence to corroborate Rick's abuse allegation. You know, I, Rick, I, I have to tell you, obviously, I, I have no idea what happened. Uh, a skeptic would say you've conveniently accused the mother that you murdered of molesting you and she can't defend herself. You understand how that's difficult for some to believe. Well, I mean, it, it's something that I worked through with a, a psychiatrist. What I did when I was 12 is the greatest regret of my life. Rick insists he's no longer that angry 12-year-old. Now 41, Rick Ennis would stand trial for yet another murder. I never murdered Lori Sosinski. She was a very close, dear friend of mine. I never would have hurt her. Prosecutor Jessica Ventieri is sure that is a lie. But at trial, she wouldn't be allowed to tell the jury anything about Rick's past. This is by far the most complicated case of my career. 
Ventieri's first hurdle was convincing the jury that Lori was, in fact, dead. She called Lori's mother, Arlene, to the stand. Did she make contact with you after her brother died? No, mm -hmm. Have you ever received a birthday card? No, mm -hmm. A Mother's Day card? <laughs> Have you ever heard from your daughter in any way since that Thursday before she disappeared? No, mm -hmm. Lindsay Braun was next, seemingly setting up a motive, telling the jury that Lori rejected Rick. She told me about a letter that he had written her. Uh, was it a love letter? Yes. She told me that she wasn't interested in him, in him that way. And Terry Booth would take the stand to recount that troubling remark he said Rick made. The end, she's trained little That she was a white piece of trailer park trash. The district attorney built her case with testimony about the scuff marks on the wall and the blood in Lori's trailer, Rick's semen on her bed, and the cigarette butt, with Rick's DNA found near Lori's scorched car. But they've got problems with this evidence. But defense attorney William Watley claimed that hand-rolled cigarette was planted, arguing police could have taken it from Rick's home. That cigarette butt didn't come from Bernsey. The defense suggested Lori was responsible for her own disappearance. They portrayed her as a drug dealer. You knew that Lori had grown marijuana. Yes. Lindsay insisted, however, that it was only for Lori's personal use. For herself, for, she shouldn't have to purchase any. But to drive home their points, Watley called Rick Ennis himself to the stand. I spent a lot of time with her. Rick insisted he had no reason to hurt Lori. Did you write a letter to Lori? Um, yes, sir, I did. I, I asked her if she wanted to date. It would have been a month or two before she went missing. I'm not certain. But even though she turned him down, Rick says they were still intimate. Now, did you ever have sex with Lori? Um, yes, sir. So what about what he said to Terry Booth? Ennis says it never happened. Did you ever go out drinking with Terry Booth? Yes, sir. Did you tell Terry Booth that you strangled someone? Yes, sir. Rick, I'm gonna show you some photographs here. That... And those rugs given to police by his former roommate, Rick claims they were not from Lori's trailer. Where did you get these rugs from? Target. Did you get any of those from Laura? Yes, sir. Rick says Lori was fine when he left her that Saturday. He says he headed off to sell some weed, and he claims she was off to do the same. The last time you saw Lori, did you have any kind of an argument with her? No, sir. Did you break into Lori's trailer that Saturday? I did not. Did you kidnap Lori? No, sir. Did you kill Lori? I, d I did not. Did you burn Lori's car? No, sir. So what about the knife? handcuffs and cleaning items in his car. Rick says it had nothing to do with Lori. He was moving things from his apartment. And those scratches on him, back in 2006, police say he had no explanation. But at the trial, he had an answer. I, I got them for playing with my dog. Ventieri barely made it to the podium to start her cross-examination. Is there anything else you'd like to blame on the dog? Ventieri questioned Rick about that blood on Lori's door. Blood in Lori's trailer has your DNA in it. How did that get there? I have no idea. And the question Ventieri really wanted an answer for, she never got. Where did you drop Lori's body? I didn't tell Lori's body anywhere. Who did then? I have no idea. Both sides had their final chance to persuade the jury. Defense attorney Watley told the jurors there wasn't any evidence that a crime had even been committed. There's no evidence that Laura was kidnapped. There's no evidence that she was forcibly taken against her will. Ventieri attacked Rick's defense. The fact that they can sit there and say that their client told the truth about anything it is 
Ventieri insisted that the volume of evidence against Rick Ennis was overwhelming, even if police still couldn't find Lori's remains. And she reminded the jury that Lori would never just take off. She would never, ever, ever lay peanut on. Never. After seven days of testimony, it was now up to the jury to decide. I'm terrified. I only get one shot at this. But you just never know what a jury's going to do. Do you believe Rick Ennis is a changed man? See more of the investigation into Lori's disappearance at 48hours.com. And uh, let gentlemen, the jury go. We should work in this case. Thank you. Hand that to the bed, please, ma'am. When the jury came back into the courtroom, did you look at their faces? Yes, I did. It was very hard to read their faces. I still wasn't sure what the verdict was going to be. Okay, the police stand. Nearly 16 years after Lori Slazinski vanished, the jury reached a verdict during their second day of deliberations. We, the jury, find defendant Daryl Richard Ennis guilty of the offense of count of murder. Guilty of the murder of Lori Slazinski. Give me a sense of what that meant to you. Sheer relief, joy, that he was finally convicted and would never get to do this to anyone else again. I'm thrilled that we were able to bring justice for Lori after such a long time. Immediately and, following uh, the jury's verdict, nice D.A. Ventieri went to Arlene with a proposal. Rick was now facing a possible death sentence, but that would trigger years of appeals and legal wrangling. To spare Arlene all that, Ventieri suggested offering Rick life without parole. Arlene agreed. It says the court that you'd be in prison the penitentiary of the state of Alabama for a term of life without the possibility of parole. Elena Atkinson was stunned. It's complete shock, disbelief. I was devastated. She was so certain Rick would be exonerated, she'd made plans to celebrate. A celebration, Rick told us, that he would be part of. I thought that we were going to go and have a nice dinner and that I was going to get to start my life over. Arlene headed home to savor the bittersweet victory. After this verdict, did you have a conversation with Lori? I did. I just said, Lori, justice has finally come. We've waited for this for a long time. And I hope you're all celebrating in heaven with the entire family. And I wish you were all here to see this day. This tragic murder, the ripple effects across your family is just incredible. It has left a very large void in my life. I was getting ready to retire. I mean, I could have been enjoying my grandchildren, possibly, uh, just spending time with my daughter, who I loved. This is Lori at her trailer, and Peanut, who she absolutely adored and vice versa. Well, we brought Peanut home with us, and he stayed with us till he was, I guess, about 16 years old and he died. Every time we mentioned Lori's name, he, he would, I don't care where he was in the house, it was like he just heard her name and he'd run in there and like, where is she? It just totally amazed me that he, he never forgot her, never. Did you ever think that six years ago we would be here today? With her husband and both her children gone, this tragic story has brought new friendships into Arlene's life. Mark Whitaker is my hero. 
him and his wife are like family to me now. This was on her graduation day, Casey, her and me. It's a great photo. And this was her a month before she disappeared at her cousin Jennifer's wedding with her cousin Thomas. Wow. Not a care in the world. No. Nope. She's one of the bravest women that I've, I've ever met. You showing all these to me just makes everything more real for me. Mm. Beautiful girl. Mm. Thanks for sharing those with me. You're welcome. I could tell she seems to be happier now. I can't thank you enough for it. It was just I wonderful. You. I love you too. Mm. You're one tough lady. Yeah. Mm. A wife and mother was said to have gone for a bike ride and never returned. The initial thought is kidnapped. She had used a spy pen to make secret recordings. It's like James Bond. Would they help solve the case? Nothing is what it seems. 48 Hours, Saturday on CBS.